Días de Vino y Radio, un programa presentado por Gabriel Ruiz López, para todos los amantes del vino, agricultores, enólogos, sommeliers, bodegueros, comerciantes, restauradores, periodistas, conectando directamente desde Barcelona, España. Thank you, Patricia. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the point of the planet you are. Today we are going to visit one more historical country, uh, it's Georgia. Uh, apparently where the wine was born and the, the oldest traces of wine coming from this country. And we will know about its history, winemaking in Quevery, which are amphoras, clay amphoras, and another stories uh, which are interesting about it. And uh, we will do also a trip uh, through Georgia together with uh, Daria Holodolina. Holodolina, sorry. <laughs> It's difficult to say like this in, uh, in a row. She's a writer and uh, she owns a travel agency related to, to wines. And she's also making her own wine since last year. She started in a mythical year, 2020. <laughs> uh, hi, Daria, how are you? Hi, hola, Gamarjova. I'm fine. Hi, from Tbilisi. <laughs> mm -hmm. You say Gamarjova? Yes, Gamarjova is the Georgian word for hello. Uh-huh, Gamarjova. So... Well, uh, nice to be in Tbilisi. I would like to be physically, but uh, we were talking. I before. hope that soon the borders will be open and we will be able to welcome all wine curious travelers here. Yeah, question of time. So let's let's be patient. Well, at first to start the program, uh, let's know about you. Uh, I would like uh, to ask you how you joined the wine world. I think you are not Georgian, you were, were born in Ukraine, and uh, how yes, you uh, to the wine and your trajectory, please. Okay, so long story short, yes, I was born in Ukraine, and uh, even when I was already a kid, I used to visit several uh, wineries with my parents, so obviously they didn't give me the wine to drink, but they gave me a bit of wine to smell, so I got interested in the way that, like, how does it work that the grapes can turn into something interesting like this and of course when I grew up I was just um, I don't know I was living in Europe a bit in Germany so I was uh, drinking European wines a lot and then when I moved to Georgia and started traveling more on weekends after my work for example um, I realized that there is a whole new world of the ancient winemaking technology so I started meeting more winemakers and at some point I was contacted by the sommelier and wine writer who is based in Spain. His name is Mikel Houdin, and uh, he was working on a book about Georgia by the time, and he invited me to be a co-author because he needed somebody local to help uh, with certain questions like culture, traveling, food, everything around wine. Uh, so we published the book in 2017, and later I quit my job in the National Tourism Board and started organizing and wine tours because I realized that it's much more fun than uh, even the good office job. So uh, to be in field, to bring people in touch with the winemakers and Georgian wine culture. And now currently during the pandemic, this business is a break, but um, I also run a wine subscription. So we deliver good wines from the small winemakers to wine curious people. Uh, once a month so this is still like wine is always in my life uh -huh. and yes last year I made my first wine with one winemaker friend in western Georgia and it was a like, very important experience in my life uh -huh. but uh, it means that your main career was not uh, related to wine but to the tourism no Uh, how to say like it was wine tourism uh, anyway so Uh, I think, yeah, now it's almost, uh, it's, it's several sequences. So it, to be honest, I started with uh, writing and journalism. I was working in the field for seven years. Then it was uh, four years in the tourism and marketing that also included all this like communication skills. And then I started uh, switching to the wine tourism and here I am. Yeah. 
Good. So, well, uh, let's go to Georgia and... Uh, Welcome. <laughs> okay, thank you. Cheers. And let's start to talk uh, from the beginning, the history of Georgia is uh, one of the cradles of wine where the traces of the oldest uh, traces uh, of the oldest yeah, cultivated grapes and also the uh, winemaking technology mm -hmm. so basically people who lived on the territory of modern Georgia around 8,000 years ago, they realized that uh, cultivating grapes give it, gives them more material for drinking wine. So they started uh, kind of growing them more compactly. And um, the chemical analysis, like uh, chemical analysis shows that the peep, those grapes are not the wild ones. It's already uh, Vitis vinifera which is very important. So they were not just drinking some wine of some wild berries, it was exactly the grapes almost, well, almost as we know it now. And um, also this uh, winemaking technology in Vevri and Amphoras, uh, buried under the ground, it also goes from uh, thousand years ago. And yes, again, oh. the archeologists, uh, yeah, everything is like around 8,000 years. So it's like- Even uh, the caveries the too. Uh, the Quarries public, the pottery was there uh, since a while, and some pottery shows already the traces of the wine, of the chem like chemical components related to uh, wine, alcoholic drinks, fermented drinks. So basically, yeah, Quarry is also around like from eight to seven thousand years old. Uh -huh. yeah. We have the pictures, uh, a couple of pictures for those who uh, might watch us on YouTube, but yeah, it's, uh, we can leave it for later. Also, I have a small quavery with me. Of course, usually those guys are around like 1000 liters big or 2000 liters sometimes, uh, but this one is kind of the demo version. So it's, it's egg shaped for those who cannot see us. I, I say it's egg shaped. Uh, it's made of uh, clay that is collected in specific areas in Georgia because it's not just any random clay you can use in the ceramic studio, for example, like a special type of red clay. Uh, and it's um, built, like the building of Quavery takes around three months, a proper building, of course. So there are now when this technology is on the rise again after years of being uh, forgotten in the Soviet time. So now the uh, many people want to make it in the villages and the quality is not very good. So there are only several families in Georgia that make really decent quavries. So I hope that this old craft will recover uh, soon and the quality will rise again. Because there are a lot of details, technical details one should know, like uh, the temperature of firing or burning the quavries, it's also very important. It should be at least 1000 degrees Celsius so that the pores uh, will be like small enough. And uh, like it's- Yeah, from, it's, from one side you have the quality of the clay and from uh, another way you have the, you need, the, yeah, the, the technique of uh, producing it, no? Yeah, yeah. You need to have proper skills uh, in order to make a good one. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I can tell you that here there are already people uh, also doing uh, wine in Quivery, but here we call it Amphora. Mm -hmm. uh, that in the past, uh, there are some wineries that I visited, they, they have big ones to, uh, to produce the wine, to ferment. But uh, there are specialists making the Quivries and they use the clay of the vineyards. I mean, uh -huh. uh, they go to the place where you are growing the vine and they take the ground and with this they, they make the, in some cases, eh? not all, but... Uh, yeah, it might make sense. I mean, if the area is big enough and uh, you can afford, so to say, to dig such a big uh, pit, because in order to build a lot of quarries, you need uh, a lot of clay, obviously. And also, well, Georgia is a compact land. It's not as mm -hmm. big as Spain, so that's why... Yeah, uh, but it, yeah. this is history what uh, the people were doing in the past uh, and uh, 
nowadays uh, most of the Georgian wine is also made in Kuevri or the, it's mixed? Also? No, like if we take uh, quantity wise, it's still like big industrial companies. They many of them have the kind of this premium line or traditional line of Kuevri wine, but uh, the majority is using the stainless steel tank. So probably um, not all of them are using the uh, wooden barrels. Some of them do, but the majority use a stainless steel. And the small artisan producers, they are rather into Kuevris, like 100% Kuevris. So nowadays in Georgia, there are like two kind of uh, wine. Yeah, two kind of technologies that coexist with each other. And now there are also several uh, international people that are moving to Georgia to make a winery here. Like, I mean, not the big scale, but like, say 10,000 bottles or something. Like I know uh, several amazing French guys who are uh, who started their Georgian adventure and one of them is practicing the traditional sparkling wine technology that we know from France or from Cava, for example. But the guy is originally from Champagne, so he will be probably offended if I will compare him to any other sparkling region. So yeah, he's practicing the Champagne technology. And there are also other guys who are practicing the uh, Petian Naturel technology, the ancestral method. Uh, so uh -huh. there are kind of new experiments made in Georgia, and I find it amazing. It's a good time to be here in terms of wine self culture development. So we would say that nowadays there is a kind of revolution in Georgia, something boiling there. Definitely, yeah, yeah. Very active stage of fermentation process. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Good, good. Yeah, interesting the history of about Georgia, and uh, let's talk also about uh, <clears throat> and also taking advantage of your experience as a travel agent, uh, <laughs> a little bit about the geography, the areas of production, how many areas of mm -hmm. production there are. Yeah, the... if you allow me to uh, screen share, of I course. can also show a couple of things to uh people who will watch us on youtube but otherwise so georgia is a as i said relatively small country if you compare it to any european countries around the same uh, area as austria uh we are uh, we have the access to the black sea and also the caucasus mountains is something that is uh, shaping our geography mentality culture like very clearly uh, Georgia in general, it's uh, very hilly, uh, so there are a lot of different climatic zones, so around the Black Sea area it's subtropical, so it's very hot and humid, and on the other side of the country we have a semi-desert, and it's very hot and dry, and in winter there are some regions where it's extremely cold, and so it's a, it's a very uh, diverse climatic conditions and when you travel from one side to another side uh, it's uh, it's very impressive how the landscape changes uh, behind your window um, and also of course in relation to wine it's also very uh, significant we have a lot of uh, different wine growing areas uh, I st still cannot share the screen unfortunately but yeah let me tell it this way. So uh, the biggest winemaking region of Georgia, Kaheti, is located exactly in the area that is hotter and uh, drier. Uh, also, uh, we have the big river there called Alazani. I'm trying to find if I have any other map. So yeah, this is the so, Sometimes I lose your, your voice when you move the head. <laughs> ah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry to the people who are listening to us at the radio. Sorry. So maybe it will be clearer if I will show it like this. So this is a, uh, our little country. So in this uh, winemaking region, Kaheti, in the east, we have a river, Alazani, that divides it into um, basically this left bank and right bank. They are slightly different. And they are the majority of Georgian popular microzones that are known abroad, such as Mokuzani, Tsinandali, Kinsmarauli, Naparauli, they are all in, in there. Mm -hmm. Also in the same area, we have like little mountains, the Tsiv Gombori range. And on the other side, there is also quite important wine growing area, Manavi. They produce like very elegant, light white wines. I, I love them. Uh, 
Uh, also, once you cross the little mountain range uh, between east and west, uh, you end up in uh, one of my favorite growing areas, uh, Imereti. And I specifically favor Imereti. the wines of Imereti. Mm -hmm. And nothing related to Emirates or something. So just, yeah, this is geographical area, Imereti, and inside of it, I like wines from Sviri and Terjola. They are also like very... Uh, light, aromatic, uh, even though when they are made in Quevri, uh, according to like with the skin contact, they are still uh, like I, I love the elegance of them. And also in the Western Georgia, I would say closer to the greater Caucasus mountains uh, on the steep slopes full of limestone, there is a region called Lechhumi. Uh, and there is also a big river, the Rioni. So you can imagine uh, how mineral the soil is around there. Mm -hmm. And they have grape solikauri that is tasting even a bit salty there. So it's like very chalky, salty white wines. And they are really excellent. And now, unfortunately, this region is under a threat because there is a big uh, hydropower plant still there. And this hydropower plant might actually destroy an important growing area there and like cause much more damage so but i hope that this amazing wines will survive somehow mm -hmm. uh, because this is very important of course I in the highlands so, yeah. in the highlands there is uh, no wine because like our caucasus mountains are around like five thousand meters high and you can imagine that in the Alp alpine zone there are no grapes but otherwise almost in every region of georgia there is something peculiar interesting style wise mm -hmm. uh, rape wise so it's a well, what is the, do you know what is the highest point of uh, cultivating vines in in georgia there are people uh, like well, around 1000 or something yeah 1000 around 1 1200 in southern Georgia in Mescheti. So Mescheti is the historical name. Now the area called uh, Samsche Javacheti. I know it's complicated. So uh, yeah, in uh, Mescheti, it's southern Georgia. It looks like a plateau. Uh, so it's a flat area uh, with volcanic soil. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, on the altitude of 1,200 meters, uh, there are little vineyards. Unfortunately, now, the, due to the historical developments, uh, the wine, the, it's not a big winemaking region, but there are enthusiastic people who cultivate grapes there. And it's a really hard work because in winter, it's extremely cold. They're like minus 30, uh, oh. windy. And yeah, they have to, they to have protect to cover... the wines from yeah cover the wines and like making fire in spring and early spring to make them warm when in at night it's getting frost frosty again so it's uh, a lot of work over there so uh, but it's uh, interesting to see the revival of wine also in in southern georgia because you know um, what i meant under the historical developments so this area was under the ottoman rule for around 300 years Mm -hmm. And you can imagine that out of religious um, uh, reasons, the growing grapes was forbidden there. So local people would bring them somewhere to the forest. So just not simply destroy them, but to take the plants and bring them to the forest uh -huh. and harvest from them uh, a bit to make some wine, you know, secretly. It's like the and dry law in the US. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the, the prohibition time, but like very long one. Mm. And now the most famous winemaker there, Georgi Natenadze, he basically started with uh, foraging grapes in the forests. These grapes that were cultivated but became almost wild there. So he's uh, picking them and making wine from them. And of course, later the bigger investment came there and he's got the opportunity to uh, kind of replant some of these plants to the terraces historical terraces there and to grow them in a more like organized way but he still has this line of production that is made of uh, grapes that are growing wild which is pretty exciting uh -huh, uh -huh. yeah <laughs> so uh, like this in gross uh, how many 
areas we can distinguish or there are like, uh, <clears throat> for example, in Spain, you know, we have the appellations of origin. Appellation, yeah. There are, uh, this is uh, the organization over there now. Yeah, so basically the system of uh, appellation in Georgia was established um, in the Soviet time, established and developed. So as you know, Georgia was a part of the Soviet Union. And uh, the major uh, microzones, the appellations such as, again, like Mokuzani, Napareuli, they were all, Panchkara, they were all registered in that time. Uh, then what I witness now, uh, the wine agency, National Wine Agency of Georgia is adding the new videos, the protected uh, designations of origin, but the old ones are not revised properly or some of them are being even expanded because, you know, commercially it's, uh, it's like Yanti case. So it's growing and growing and growing so that more people could more companies could produce their, na their wine under the, say, Mukuzani label. Uh, so I don't find it very good, very uh, a good idea because uh, the real, uh, really good small growing areas are so special that you need to protect those. But yeah, well, uh, now probably the wine agency wants to also to help uh, commercial well, wine. There there or... should be some some way if uh, Georgia focus in exporting the wines, and I think like every country they, they are now yeah, yeah. in this trip. Um, it needs to give some uh, some keys to the consumer to to make the choice because Georgian wine is Georgian wine, but uh, I think between one and the other there will be very big differences. So. Uh, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would say that there are several really interesting terroirs that the ones I mentioned with this uh, salty mineral uh, wine from Lechhumi and uh, the Spetsetian wines. I think they also deserve their PDO, their appellation mm -hmm. uh, kind of designation, but uh, they don't have it yet. So probably it will come, I hope. Uh, and there are some of them that are kind of outdated uh, from the Soviet period still, but they are, they are still in the list. So I hope that there will be more kind of governmental revision and systematization happen mm -hmm. in the yeah in the upcoming years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it so is... it's a bit complicated for the yeah for the people who want to buy Georgian wine for the first time just to. Um, it's, very, it's very difficult. First, uh, we have a couple of barriers. One is the, the, the name of the grapes uh, are not easy. We will talk about this later uh, from one side. And another side is this, what I mentioned, you know, because, uh, well, to find the ideal way for the consumer to understand about uh, the regions is very difficult because we tried in Spain one, one way. In France, uh, for, for example, Bourgogne, Burgundy, and uh, Bordeaux, they have many sub-regions inside the region. So you say Bordeaux, yes. you say Bourgogne, but inside there are a lot of uh, small appellations. No? So it's quite difficult. But mm -hmm. there should be a way, at least, to, to help the consumer to know well, uh, about Where does it choice. come from? Yeah. Even when you buy like uh, yes, well-known uh, wines like yeah, Bordeaux, Burgundy, you can understand how special was the this micro growing area. And in our case, yeah, it's uh, complicated. But it's again, it's a niche for people like uh, who, who want to kind of get to investigate more informed about Georgian wine. Yeah, so it's uh, mm -hmm. so on one hand it's interesting. On the other hand, yeah, it needs more. Kind of governmental systematizing. It yeah, no, nothing is good or bad. I mean, uh, all the coins have two faces, no? And, Size, and, yeah, two faces. And um, in, the, in this case, uh, for Georgia to open to to the to the western side, because in in the east, and now I want to talk about this also, because uh, historically to belong to the Soviet, Soviet Union, Union was something. 
But to open to the Western countries should be, well, have to find a way. And uh, I... talking about uh, this East, uh, during the Soviet Union, the Georgian wines were very popular in, in Russia no, in general. And uh, do you think it has been positive or negative for the for the Georgian wines? Because uh, I don't know. Uh, at that time, they were famous. In the last, well, uh, when I started to go to Russia, I was already out of the Soviet Union, was disappeared. But the uh, fame was that there were semi-sweet red wines. What can this you tell us about, about this kind of anecdotes? <laughs> well, unfortunately, it's not an anecdote because, uh, yeah, Georgian wine was famous and uh, obviously, how to say, there was no culture of, uh, like, sophisticated consuming wine. It should have been massively produced wine for the uh, people who work hard and just want to have something to kind of unwind, relax and everything. And, of course, the sweet wine... Um, is uh, easier to drink. It's probably quite often, it also is more alcoholic and you can get drunk, let's call it like as it is, like uh, by its name. It's easier to get drunk and uh, forget all your worries from the like <laughs> building socialism the whole day long. Yeah. Um, and the, for example, the one of the most famous semi-sweet wines, Kinsmara Uli wine from Tacheti, also from Alazani River Basin. This wine uh, is naturally semi-sweet, so there is, of course, no, like, normally, there is no added sugar, so the wines just collect a lot because it's a very sunny area, and uh, basically the grapes have a lot of sugar, and then also during the fermentation process, it's getting stopped artificially, so by, uh, by low temperature, so the yeasts die and uh, some sugar remains. And then, of course, you need a lot of uh, stabilizers to, uh, mm -hmm. not to so, so that it will not start to reflement. So the sugar is natural. The sugar is from the grape. Uh -huh. Also, there is uh, another famous wine, uh, Hvanchkara, that is uh, considered, like according to all this like post-Soviet folklore, it's considered to be the favorite wine of Stalin. But to be honest, the... Panchkara PPO, like Appellation, was registered after his death. Mm. So theoretically, he couldn't have had Panchkara, Panchkara. Uh, this wine was also known uh, as a, like wine from that region, was known as a Saki Piano wine uh, by, uh, because there was a area that belonged to a noble family, Kipiani, and they used to produce the wines from these grapes in Panchkara microzone. Then, of course, when the collectivization happened and like the, all this plan economy started, uh, it, it, it became a completely different wine. But because the grapes are still so good and aromatic, it's, it became a very popular and very expensive wine because there are not much as mm -hmm. well. So, uh, But yeah, this uh, Stalin-related folklore is really funny. Sometimes it's like in, the, um, how to say, in a certain way, I saw a lot of counterfeit etiquettes printed abroad and put to the Georgian wines. For example, in Poland, in, Ger in Germany, with Stalin portrait, it's oriented on the, I don't know, maybe on some fans of, I, I, I don't know, like on some crazy people who live there <laughs> and who can still buy this wine uh, because of the label. But um, yeah, so in post-Soviet countries, uh, the, the semi-sweet wines are really popular. But Georgia mm -hmm. has much more others yeah yeah but, uh, one thing this these wines you mentioned they are naturally sweet but there were a lot because I, I remember I have visited a, a warehouse of uh, one big importer in Moscow in the mm -hmm. end of the 90s and they had uh, a lot of stock of Georgian wines lot but uh, mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of cases. And they were I suppose that in the 90s it could have been a lot of also like this counterfeit wine or the one with the added sugar because 90s was a terrible it, This is the question, it was just with a commercial purpose because we know that in many regions of Russia uh, 
the people prefer to drink semi-sweet because they are easy to drink. And as you said, also, it helps to forget uh, your problems. <laughs> Uh, and, and this is the meaning of the question. Uh, was it uh, just made for commercial purposes? No, I suppose in the 90s. So in, in the 90s, Georgia, when, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Georgia had a war. Mm -hmm. uh, it had really like bad economy, economic situation. So I suppose that those, uh, if there was any winemaking that could go on export, like the wine that could go on export, maybe there were some people who would uh, manipulate the wine in that way. So I, I don't exclude it, but in the mm -hmm. 90s, I was too, too young to kind of prove it empirically. But now from what I see, even the big uh, factories, the yeah, big producers who produce semi-sweet wines and send it to the post-Soviet countries like Russia, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, uh, they don't play with sugar and everything because now the quality control is higher. In order to send wine to export, you need to go through the checkups with the lab and national wine agency. So they, they don't mess with the things anymore. But in the 90s, I think everything was possible. Yeah, these were very, very know, Difficult tur turbulent, turbulent times uh, in the region. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I and I remember that in this moment uh, there started to be a political problem be between Russia and, and Georgia. Georgia. They have uh, stopped the imports, and it. Yeah, it was in, I mean, the, in early two thousands, and actually this uh, ban of Georgian produce of Georgian wine in Russia, it was actually good for quality because they realized that they cannot export this manipulated wines anymore. And uh, in Europe, nobody needs such wines. And that's why that was also the time when the small wineries that produce every wine, uh, skin contact wine, all this like unusual wines, it was the time for them to rise <laughs> and to yeah. jump on this train of uh, natural wine and exotic wines from Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, well, now let's talk about the queen of the history. The queen is the grape. No, uh, well, in Spanish is feminine. I don't know in other languages. In Georgia, we don't have the gender in the language, so uh, that's why when, for example, Georgians speak uh, Russian or English, it's always confusing because you, sometimes they, yeah, they confuse he, she. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> it happens and, quite often. Yeah. Yeah, it's but true. in Georgia, in the 13th century, uh, Georgian King Demetra wrote a prayer to the grapevine. So it's definitely even more than a queen. <laughs> okay. Something, so, yeah. And there are like uh, more than 400 uh, varieties, no? Uh, around 500, to be honest. So we have the, like, uh, there are several nurseries all around the country. Mm. And the biggest one is not far from Tbilisi in Jigaura, in like this small uh, settlement. And there are around 500 grape varieties on spot, so like uh, reconstructed, wow. so to say. And in Georgian ampelography books, there are also like a bit more than 500, mm -hmm. but uh, some of them also include the other grapes that grew on the territory of Georgia, like Aligote and, you know, like Pino and so on. Uh, so technically it's, yeah, it's definitely more than 500, but endemic grapes, there are, there are so many. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately now in the active produce, we have around, 30 something mm. but it's still it's quite a lot oh. and for example on the shelves in the supermarkets you will mostly see Georgian wines you will probably not easily find some international one and among the Georgians even though for example in Georgia we do have like Cabernet Sauvignon right now and like Sauvignon Blanc and like these popular grape varieties from all of, like global, globally uh, you will not see those on the supermarket shelf, even grown in Georgia. So you will see Saperavi, Rkaceteli, Kisi, Solika Uri. Which, which are the main grapes uh, for you? Mention three white, three reds. Okay, so my favorite is uh, Mutsvane. <laughs> it's, it's, it has this tricky but white? yeah, you white? get used to it's white, white. white. Uh, Mutsvane is white, but actually the name means green. 
So because of the, like when the wine is made without skinness, it's like it has this uh, greenish uh, light color. Uh, so it's called because of the color. Savannah. Yeah, uh, yeah Savannah. Then what I like, uh, Hichli. <laughs> I know. Hichli and, and, and Krahuna. It's three whites. So uh, Kis, um, Savannah and Hichli grow in Eastern Georgia and Krahuna is from the West, uh, from Imereti. And among the reds, it's, yeah, well, you cannot skip Saperavi. Saperavi is a very uh, complex grape. It can grow anywhere, not only in Georgia. I tasted Saperavi from Uzbekistan once and from Ukraine and from many, yeah, from many places. So it, it really like, it grows everywhere and it reflects the, uh, terroir the area very well. Uh, also, there is one red called Otshanuri Sapere. It's from Western Georgia, and 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 what else? And probably Shavkapito. Shavkapito is from Central Georgia, and it's it's a lighter red. It's not as hardcore as Saperavi or Otshanuri Sapere. It's you know it's a more light-bodied red, and it's sometimes you need wines like this because in Georgia everything is usually like the wines the red wines are very straightforward and I keep hunting for lighter wines I always I'm always happy when some producers are experimenting with less skin content or with uh, like um, yeah with less time uh, in Quevery probably or something like this and I like lighter reds uh -huh. yeah and what about the the viticulture, uh, what is the trend now? Is um, something like a minimal intervention or so people who are doing also um, uh, biodynamic. biodynamics or so on? Uh, yes, of course, of course. So basically I'm mostly like I'm friends with and I'm working with for my tours or my subscription with the people who work with minimal, minimal intervention. So yeah, natural wine is a very broad term, but yeah, minimal intervention is good for me. So I prefer the wine that is uh, not clarified with chemicals and where pesticides are not used at the vineyard. So at least this, uh, so that the, the less, less is better. Uh, uh -huh. There are several people who work biodynamically. Uh, there are two people who have the matter certificate. And uh, for example, two years ago, I had uh, one of my guests was uh, Gramona family, the producers of uh, sparkling wine in Spain, mm -hmm. as you know. And it was a very interesting experience because we visited uh, some biodynamic and natural producers and it was a very interesting exchange of uh, opinions and practices. And it was December, so it was a pretty you know, boring time. So it's uh, like all is a gray and everything, but uh, at least we could see what winemakers, uh, like the winemakers from Spain could see what winemakers from Georgia do at the same time and experience the uh, kind of less popular uh, traveling uh, mm -hmm. period here. Um, yeah, and back to viticultural practices. Yeah, so the like now more and more even bigger companies, they start having the kind of bio vineyard. So they might have the conventional one and in some other area, they might have the bio one. So it's trendy, of course, they can, I suppose that many big companies understand that you can sell your wine in a more expensive category after you, well, basically the bio work and like biodynamic organic growing is also more complicated you need to put more labor into that. So obviously this wine is more expensive. And uh, mostly people like this, I'm showing the bottle of my wine that I'm drinking now, like one of a friend of mine. What's the uh, name? So, Do Re Mi. <laughs> Do Re Mi. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Not the, <even>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mamuka, the founder of this company, the co-founder of this company, like small seller, he said that the idea behind Doremi wine is that the wine should be simple as Doremi, as the, you know, the first three notes. Uh, mm -hmm. But I would say that this wine is actually quite complex. So they are working organically and there are more and more uh, sellers like this. So I can compare with seven years ago, 
there were like, I don't know, a group of 15 or something, and now they are like 80 and they are growing. The amount of people who start farming organically is growing and it's a, it's a very nice trend. Yeah, it looks like it's an um, international trend too. Uh, in many countries it's happening, the, this phenomenon of um, going backwards to go forward. No? It's, uh... yeah, we need to take care about the planet because, well, there is no plan B so far. I mean, Elon Musk is still working on the colony on Mars, so we have to survive here. Well, it will take time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, in any case. <laughs> And meanwhile, we have to drink wine. So the better is to produce it in the, in the better way. <laughs> and uh, well, I see you are drinking orange wine. It's one yes. of the, it, it is? It is orange yes, wine? Yes. Yes, well, uh, in Georgia, we prefer the word amber so that there will be no confusion between uh -huh. like, you know, wine made of oranges. So this is basically the uh, amber uh, wine well, definition is well. based on the color, skin contact wine. Uh -huh. No, the, qu wine. the question is that uh, in, in, in Spain and I suppose also in France and Italy, wine, the word wine is only used only wine. Yeah. for made from grapes. Grapes, yeah. exactly. If it is made yeah. from strawberries or cherries or whatever, it's not wine. It's exactly. Illegal... Yeah. According to the Georgian law, it's the same. Wine is only made of grapes. But uh, how to say that? Like, probably marketing-wise, it's not the best, this orange wine, because I've heard people, for example, from America asking about, like, oh, orange wine, is it made of oranges? So mm. uh, mm. that's why I, I suppose, like... Uh, Georgia promotes uh, its wine as amber, but mm -hmm. I, I would prefer like easier way for me, like skin contact white wine, but because it's the skin that gives this color. Uh, and and it's true. Very dark. And it's true, it's amber, it's not orange color. <laughs> it's amber. So it, uh, it's a white made with a skin contact. Yeah, so it's basically the easiest explanation is that wine, white wine that was vinified as red. So basically, it was not only juice participating in the fermentation, but also the uh, skins of the grape and sometimes stems. Uh, so yeah, from what I saw in many, like many uh, friends of mine are working exactly in, in this way. So basically, the selected bunches of grapes are crushed together just without uh, separation of um, stems and then they go like to quivery then the fermentation starts happening so first uh, let me this this was my again. next question too about the stemming <laughs> or the uh, uh, with the stem or the stemming it's it's the winemaker's choice there are some uh, grape varieties that have uh, like that that the stems of them are ripening at the same time as the grapes. So for example, Rkacitelli, the most popular widespread white wine. Uh, so Rkacitelli stems are getting ripe early. And Vane, my favorite, uh, the stems remain a bit greenish uh, longer. And sometimes it doesn't make sense to add them to wine because they give this unpleasant green notes, something you don't want in your wine. So people who work with Mitvane often separate the stems. So it will depend on the grape? It will depend yeah, on, on the grape, on the region of the level of ripeness. It's basically mm -hmm. it's winemaker decision what mm -hmm. he or she wants to achieve. And uh, for aging, uh, they use uh, any kind of uh, boot, oak or other boots? Or? Not, not often. So I would say probably the bigger companies, yes, because they can also afford it. Mm -hmm. uh, the smaller wineries, and it's mostly for reds, because to red, it's, they, they taste really elegant and good. If the, of course, the uh, barrels are good. Uh, but for embers, I'm not sure if it suits to it. I mean, it's possible, of course. Mm -hmm. I also drank the amber wines made in wood from uh, Czech Republic and Austria. So there they can just make wine in acacia uh, barrels. But to me, it was over aromatic. So mm -hmm. it's aroma of the grape plus with acacia barrel. So it was too perfumey for me. So I would say maybe like three months if the barrel is uh, maximum for Georgian amber wine. Then it's getting too woody. Like it, 
I don't know. Like again, it's all about the winemaker, <laughs> but the majority, yeah, majority of uh, those who work with Cuvée don't use the barrels for aging. So it's sometimes uh, stainless steel and sometimes like well, bottle bottle aging. Mm -hmm. But for the reds, for the reds, yes, uh, there are some uh, wines with, uh, which are aged in oak, right? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But again, like it's rather the medium size and big wineries who do that. The smaller ones don't. Uh, so the it's kind of I would say it's 50 50 Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's say that the the smaller wineries are more focused in making whites and quivery wines, and uh, um, the big wineries are making uh, full range. More so. probably, yeah. They they work more like international style because. Uh, Usually the big wineries are exporting, like their um, kind of destination of export is more mostly like Eastern Europe mm. uh, and mm. the US. So they need more like, you know, approachable style and Europe wise, like, uh, as I know, like Germany, uh, Scandinavian countries, they buy more of um, this interesting, unusual Georgian wine, which is Quevri or Quevri plus stainless steel. And uh, they rather go for the skin contact whites without wood at all. Mm -hmm. So it also what depends. What about what about your own wine? Does oh, it, my own wine. Does it have a name? Uh, well, no brand name so far because it's it was an experimental one. But the grape is uh, Otshanuri Sapera, this red from uh, Western Georgia. I made it in Kvevri. Uh, and the like I made an experiment so one uh, like there were three small quavries and in two quavries the skin contact so the red skins stayed with the juice for one month and the smallest quavery had the uh, had the skins there for like for a longer period of time I we will open it in the end of February to see what happened and how it influences the uh, quality of the wine uh -huh. uh, so yeah, so, soon I will know <laughs> because so usually the red wines don't have this long skin contact. It usually doesn't make sense, but this friend of mine said that uh, he tried it last year and the wine was like very smooth, even though it was young, it tasted, you know, like in a more velvety way. So I decided, okay, then I will make a part of it like this and part of it like that. So yeah, in the end of February, we will take it from Quevri and I will let you know <laughs> if uh, like so which way of means, skin contact works. It means meanwhile it is in the Quevri, you cannot uh, check how it is going and so on? Or uh, well, you can. So in the bigger Quevris, so yeah, in general, Quevri is sealed hermetically after the fermentation, like al alcoholic fermentation is over. So mm -hmm. when it stops boiling, um, the winemaker seals it and some of winemakers really don't touch it till uh, spring, till March or April. Wow. But sometimes the lid, so that there is, they put a glass on the top, uh, like uh, seal it with clay and also put some soil on the top so that it will be like the temperature will be more or less stable like inside of the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of them are making the small hole here and uh, they can taste it with pipette from time to time. Uh, so it's also possible, but we didn't touch my wine. So that's why it will be a really a big surprise and big, big mystery. Joy. <laughs> yeah. Big mystery. It's yeah? almost like a birth, you know, mm -hmm. birth of new wine. Mm -hmm. After, yeah. Not, not bad, not bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. So yeah, uh, the first attempt was about experiments, but this uh, in this season, so to say, wants to make a bit more and uh, to work with whites as well. It's one of Rahuna probably. It would be okay. very interesting. Yeah. And well, we are arriving to the to the end because the time flies <laughs> so yeah. yeah so fast. Uh, well, before the last two questions uh, about your book. But you also wrote a book, uh, and yeah. uh, how how it is going, and what it talks about. It talks about Georgian wines, and 
Yes, yeah, so uh, with Mikhail Houdin, as I mentioned, we uh, co-authored uh, the Guide to the Cradle of Wine. So this is the, um, uh, a very useful book for those who want to travel to Georgia and experience the wineries and to be prepared. So there are not only the wineries descriptions and contacts, but also the you're given the context, basically the uh, micro zones, like the, the growing areas, how to travel, like uh, the alphabets, because Georgia has very different alphabets. So how to deal with the alphabet, what are the good places to eat, drink, stay, and so on. So it's not like Lonely Planet, but if, if um, like I, I would prefer this book to the Lonely Planet. So it has just enough amount of information for a person who wants to uh, experience different regions and different styles. And it has all the contacts uh, and it doesn't try to sell you anything but information, mm -hmm. <laughs> practical information. Yeah, it's uh, a yes. wine, wine trip uh, book. Yeah. Wine yes, yeah, exactly. exactly. And uh, also it's interesting about the alphabet because it's uh, really special, uh, Georgian alphabet. Yeah, it's a very old alphabet and very different because it doesn't look like any European or Cyrillic alphabet. Uh, so, yeah, it can be like in Georgia, we usually like the road signs adapt. So it's there in Georgian and Latin alphabet. The street signs are usually also done in the same, like also in two alphabets. But uh, sometimes like in the small shops or somewhere where you cannot find the Latin alphabet, you are stuck. And that's why we mm -hmm. prepared the whole yeah, <laughs> line of alphabet. I will prepare for the trip when I will be yeah. lucky to go there. And well, there are the last two questions. Um, what is your favorite grape? Uh, out of 500, oh my God, Mtswane. Mtswane, Mtswane forever. I'm a Mtswanist. Mtswanist, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. But you made your wine with another grape. <laughs> uh, because I made it in uh, Western Georgia uh -huh. and uh, Mtswane grows in the other area. So, uh -huh. That was the choice of what was available there, and I chose my favorite red. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. good. And the last question is uh, to match uh, a song and a wine. Which song you will listen, taking which wine? Uh -huh. Oh, it's again, it's quite complicated. So to me, all this Georgian uh, natural wine sing is a complete like rock and roll, like, you know, old. Uh -huh. uh, music like Rolling Stones, probably. Uh, uh -huh. But sometimes in the Georgian, like very Georgian rural situation, when there is a polyphonic music, traditional polyphonic music, it's also very impressive. Uh, so I would say, yeah, it's either or. It's either. Let's, uh, let's choose both. We will, today we will close with uh, two songs. One from amazing. Rollings. Tell me which one from Rollings. Oh, well, what do you have in your library? <laughs> it's, yeah, it depends. Anything. Mm, let me think. I, and shall I, uh, do you have the polyphonic songs? Uh, the polyphonic songs will be more difficult to find, but we will do. Ah, well, uh, look for Chakrulo because, you know, the uh, Chakrulo was the song that was sent to the space on the Voyager ship. So if aliens will ever discover this how, ship, how, you it? how you spell music. it? Uh, Chakrulo, C-H-A-K-R-U-L-O. It's like something re not, not related to chakras or yoga or okay. something. It's Chakrulo. Just Chakrulo. Chakrulo. And probably I can get no satisfaction because in, in the wine, you can never get enough. It's always something. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Perfect choice, I think. Thank you. And well, I thank you very much for this approach uh, to Georgia. It uh, has been a nice talk and I hope uh, the audience have enjoyed as well. You're and, very welcome uh, in Georgia. Sorry? You're very welcome in Georgia. Thank you for having me. Thank you a lot. And uh, well, I hope the people will also feel this uh, envy to go to to Georgia and discover this uh, beautiful country. Because one thing I know is the kitchen, the cuisine is uh, very good too. And uh, I think the people are very 
open and uh, you know, friendly. Hospitable, yeah, we like guests. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so thank you so much again. Thank you. Well, friends, uh, to hear the program of today, I hope you enjoyed the trip to, to Georgia with uh, Daria and uh, well, have a good weekend, uh, be happy, uh, drink good wine and uh, see you soon. Bye-bye.